So did you paint? Did they paint it? It's all painted. What color? Same color it was oh, before. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. We're going to we're going to begin chapter 11 of Revelation, no, chapter 12 of Revelation 12. Wow. I need to restart the video. I'm going to have to edit that out. All right. We're going to start chapter 12 tonight in Revelation. Uh for those of you at home, you can find the resources in the link uh on the YouTube. They're right here. Okay. I, I had them up here, so make sure Randy gets one. I didn't know that's what you went looking no. for. Okay, it's a, it's a new chapter. Yeah, you knew. <laughs> uh, you, anyway, you could get the resources at the link. And uh, chapter 12 is starts uh, a, a couple chapters that are uh, very filled with symbolism and filled with uh, visions that we're going to see. Uh, John's going to name these as visions, and they all have a purpose. They're not arbitrary. Nothing in God's word is arbitrary. Uh, they have a purpose both in terms of what's going on during the tribulation, uh, but some of the things point backward to things that happen uh, much further back in time. So it's an interesting chapter. Uh, so we're going to jump into it here just a moment because again i'm not ready uh get it up on the screen for the folks at home hold on just a second oh and and As easy as that. There we go. All right. So let's start with chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to read down through verse 6, and then we'll take some time to talk about that. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,200 in 60 days. All right. So we have again a lot of uh, a lot of imagery, a lot of symbolism here in this vision that is given to John. This is what we consider the fourth inset or parenthetic uh, in the book of Revelation. As we've talked about those those different insets or parenthetics, they give us information that sometimes moves the book forward chronologically, but sometimes it gives us uh, they're, they're designed to give us information about things that are going on uh, on the ground, if you will, in the tribulation that happen in, in past times. And this is one of those that we get a lot of information in chapter 12, especially about things that happened in the past, but also going to talk about some things that happened during the tribulation uh, and uh, that deal directly with the nation of Israel. So we have... Um, a few important figures in this chapter, actually in the next two chapters, uh, the woman in chapter 12, which we're going to look at, is uh, is symbolic of Israel. We'll talk about why that is. If, you've, uh, if you're if you familiar with uh, the Old Testament, especially, I think it's pretty clear uh, as to why the woman is symbolic of Israel. The dragon, who is symbolic of Satan. Uh, closely identified as a serpent or a dragon, all the way back to the book of Genesis. So uh, that one's also pretty clear. The male child is uh, Jesus Christ, and we're going to see why that's made clear in the text. Uh, and then Michael, who is not symbolized at all, is just identified as Michael, and the only Michael, significant Michael we have in Scripture is Michael the archangel. 
uh, who is uh, associated with Israel, uh, both in the Old Testament and the New. So we're going to see Michael make an appearance as we go to chapter 13. We're going to look at two different beasts, the beast from the land of the sea and the beast from the land and the beast from the sea. Uh, it, it, um, hmm is pointing to the Antichrist, represents, that's the word I'm looking for, represents the Antichrist uh, and uh, the beast from the land, the false prophet. So we'll talk about those in due course. We won't get to those obviously tonight, but note that the church is absent from the list. And that may indicate, again, that the church has been raptured or is not part of the tribulation. Uh, and we, as we talked about many weeks back in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 and some other scripture, uh, but the four individuals that we're going to focus on in chapter 12, and I don't know if we'll get through the whole chapter or not, but we'll we'll see how, how many comments, questions you all have. Um, the first one that we're going to deal with is the woman. And again, as John is, is witnessing the things that he's seen, last time we talked about the... Um, uh, the the resurrection of the witnesses we talked you know we didn't did yeah we did we did read through this last part we didn't spend a lot of time on 15 through 19 because it's pretty self-evident but if anybody has any comments or questions about that I, it's, i'm happy to talk about it tonight but the last thing that john saw is this declaration which was the seventh trumpet uh, that the kingdom belongs to Christ. This is this is it. The kingdom is is finally uh, going to be uh, realized. It is it is declarative in what is uh, sounded out by the angel who sounds the seventh trumpet. Uh, you have all these loud voices in heaven in verse fifteen through nine through eighteen that declare uh, their thanks to God. Uh, the declaring the the authority of Jesus Christ as the one there in verse six or 17 uh, and so forth. And then we have this kind of grand uh, scene in verse 19 where the temple of God in heaven was open. And this is distinguished from the tribulation temple that we talked about last week. It's the temple of God in heaven. Uh, the Ark of His Covenant was seen there in heaven. It's not the same Ark that was on the earth. This is an Ark uh, that is in heaven, and we're not talking about Noah's Ark. We're talking about the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, this is what uh, the Ark and the tabernacle and later the temple were patterned after. We go to the book of Hebrews, and that's what we find, that God gave Moses uh, representations of things that were in heaven and gave him a pattern to follow to have them represented on earth. So these are the actual heavenly, uh, the actual heavenly temple, the actual heavenly ark of his covenant. Uh, and John had the opportunity to see that as they were open, there's great lightning, noise, thunder, and earthquake and great hail. And that seems to indicate those things happen on the earth. And we've seen this before. There are actions that take place in heaven in the book of Revelation that have uh, consequences or that have uh, effects on the earth. Uh, it would be odd to have lightning, noise, thunder, earthquake, and a hail on earth. As a matter of fact, uh, earthquake in heaven, I'm sorry, on in heaven. So it would make, it would stand to reason these happen on earth. As a matter of fact, an earthquake in heaven doesn't make sense because it's not earth. Uh, it makes sense that it happens uh, on the earth. So uh, those are the last things John sees. And as we turn to chapter 12, uh, John sees something else. And, you know, what a what a sensation it must have been to be John to almost everywhere he turned. There was something else. There was something else that was uh, specifically given by God for John to see and to record. And that goes all the way back to chapter one, where Christ told him he needs he's going to write the things down that he's going to be shown. And so this is another thing that God expressly, or we could say Christ expressly, is showing John for the purpose of recording it and having kind of a pre-witness of the things that will happen in the future in John uh, to testify to these things that not only will they happen, but in a kind of mind-bending sense, they've already happened because John's seen them. He's had the opportunity to see 
uh, time, if you will, as God does and see the things that are going to happen uh, in a sense as though they already have. And, and I love that about uh, prophetic scripture uh, because it, it, because God has said, this is what is going to happen and gives such vivid pictures for both John and for us in the pages of scripture, we can have absolute confidence that they will happen uh, because they have been shown by, uh, by God to John and recorded for us. So what does John see? He sees a great sign. Well, let me say before that, anybody have any comments or questions on the rest of chapter 11? whether it's related to this yeah that's it's one of Paul says it's the last right if it's the same trumpet or if it's the seven of series seven it's the last you know yeah. what I mean if they're like I do the I do well, it's uh, it remains to be seen. <laughs> it it certainly you know some people some theologians connect that that statement in First Corinthians fifteen with the rapture and the events there. Uh, some see it as some who who still teach the rapture see that as a distinct trumpet that is not necessarily related to uh, the the rapture at all. It's part of uh, the 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 doctrine of the of the resurrection in, in chapter fifteen, and it has something. It's related to something else, and of course, some relate it to uh, the feast of trumpets, which, by the way, starts today uh, in in Israel. Um, and you know, I know some of you are, are pretty new here. I'm not afraid to say I don't know if I don't know because. I'm more, I'm actually more emphatic. I don't think we can know for sure. Uh, we can, we can speculate, could be, uh, you know, there, there, it's significant in its declarations. I mean, these are significant declarations that are made in relation to the last trumpet, uh, but they're also introductory if you take the view that the seventh trumpet brings us to the seven bowls. And so, um, I don't necessarily see a, a a connection myself, but that's not to say there's not one. I just I don't know that that we can make a good case biblically. I know people make cases biblically. I just don't know if it's a good case or not. Uh, whether this trumpet's related to the that trumpet or not. Anybody else? Or ain't you want to add anything to that, Stephen? No, I, I've I've tried. To, I've seen I've seen the argumentation for. And most of them always have you know backloaded baggage of having to fit that into the theology we understand too. But uh, I thought I was running the top and I haven't come to a conclusion on it. I'm, I'm trying to you know part yeah. of my internal struggle is referring to when Paul referring to trumpets it's like those would be audible to the people he's hearing, but in Revelation, not the trumpets are necessarily audible to people on earth. You know, it's not it's not clear enough to make it. It's to, not. It's not. It makes it difficult. It does. And and we have to be super careful when it's not clear to be too definitive. And uh, I hope that's reflected even in the study notes that try to say it could be this or it might be this, because there are some things that we can be very definitive about. Um, uh, there are others that are connected to time or other events in other books of scripture that it's certainly much, much foggier. I mean, the 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 one connection there is between uh, Revelation as a whole and 1 Corinthians 15 and, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians 4 is they are pointing, all of them are pointing toward the future, even though a lot of 1 Corinthians 15 has to do with the doctrine of the resurrection itself. It's talking about what still lays ahead for uh, for believers and, and unbelievers alike. We're going to see at the end of Revelation, there's two resurrections. There's a resurrection to life and a resurrection to, to judgment or resurrection to death, if you will. And, and so everybody gets resurrected. And I think even a lot of Christians miss that point that uh, everybody gets resurrected, but you don't want a part in, uh, you don't want a part in one of them. You want a part in the resurrection to life. And that only comes through Jesus Christ.
Anybody else in chapter 11? All right. Uh, so John, again, kind of turns or just before him, he, he sees here's another sign. And it's it's one thing after another, one, one sign, one thing to write down, one thing to witness after another. Uh, and it says that he sees this great sign uh, that appears in heaven. And the sign here, Simeon, uh, is a sign pretending remarkable events soon to happen, which is a pretty, pretty big definition for a little word. But it means that these are things that are of significant nature uh, when you look at the Greek word. And this appears in heaven. I, I think something that Stefan said a moment ago is 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 important unless unless we're told specifically that something in the book of Revelation was visible or audible on earth and we're given the context here and given the context at the end of chapter 11 it appears it's confined to that area uh, and so I don't think I don't think we have any indication that the trumpet sounds are heard on earth uh, as a matter of fact, there in verse 15, with the seventh trumpet, trumpet, the seventh angel sounded, and there was loud voice, there were loud voices where in heaven, uh, and that doesn't absolutely exclude this trumpet from being heard on earth, but we really don't have any indication it was. And the same is here, that this sign isn't seen uh, by anybody on earth that we're told it's only seen by John. It may be only revealed for John. Uh, and as it's revealed, he sees a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and uh, with stars in her hair, or on her head. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, well, before we do, this is the first of seven signs we're going to see in the latter half of Revelation. Uh, they're all significant. They're all to lend to uh, our understanding, John's understanding of what's going on or what will go on during the tribulation. Uh, as with uh, many Old Testament prophecies, this woman is not an actual woman, but a symbol. Uh, this is much more like the things we see in uh, Jeremiah's prophecies and the things that he saw, the signs that God gave him to illustrate the things that, uh, that were going to take place or to illustrate a point. Uh, this is similar to that. God uses some uh, uh, symbolism that John as both an apostle and as a Jew would understand and like the the designation of the the of Satan connected with the serpent or the dragon goes all the way back to Genesis well this uh this some of this symbolism with the uh, sun moon and stars and this woman goes back to Genesis as well where where do we see it where do we see any of that symbolism in Genesis anybody remember you think about it, a place in Genesis where we have uh, a, a, a vision or a sign that involved the moon and the stars and the sun. Yeah, with Joseph. And you have those uh, those stars that are bowing down to Joseph and you have the, the sun and moon there. And so uh, I only say that to say this this is something that John as uh, as a Jewish individual certainly would understand going back and drawing on the Hebrew scriptures, uh, that this is somehow related to Israel. So um, we also have symbolism in in the Old Testament uh, with Isaiah in, in the prophets of Israel being portrayed as a woman in many different ways, as the wife of God, as uh, uh as a mother, as different things. So it's it's pretty it's pretty rich, but it's also pretty elemental for uh, someone who who understood the Jewish uh, uh, heritage and the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and just suddenly, you know, after this uh, description of her, uh, the 12 stars are certainly representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I am. Let's just jump down to where we talk about her in, uh, on, the, on the second page down in uh, letter V or letter five, number five. Um, and talk about who she is and what she is. The other women that we're going to see in Revelation symbolically are yet to come. Uh, so we'll talk about that when we get to them. But this woman is clothed with the sun. She has the moon under her feet. She has the 
garland of stars around her head. The sun is uh, might equate to Israel's status as God's chosen people. Uh, light, uh, the sun itself, uh, is is not to be certainly worshipped, but it's it's often used in that illustration of what God is. God dwells in unapproachable light. Uh, God is uh, is our light, the light of the world, and so forth. So uh, that makes sense. The moon uh, may represent God's enduring covenant relationship with Israel. We see some reference, references to that in the Psalms. Uh, and then again, the 12 stars, the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, it's it's kind of interesting and maybe a little off the beaten path, but we were looking at the parable of the lost coin last night in the parable study, and uh, the woman had 10, 10 coins. She lost one. Uh, she basically took the house apart looking for it. But kind of the background on that and why Christ used it with a woman there is because it was common practice in Jesus' day for uh, a woman to have this garland of coins, uh, a married woman to have this garland of coins that she'd either wear around her neck or in her hair. And uh, I wasn't, I, frankly, all these years, I was not familiar with that. I'd never run across that. Uh, but it it kind of crosses over to this, that this would make sense as to why uh, she has this, this uh, garland of stars. It's very similar to that garland of coins in the, uh, in the lost coin parable. Uh, it would be kind of like a parable to John to show him this vision and and he could relate to this is what a woman in Israel would uh, would dress like and uh, she would put those things on display. And here Israel has on display, portrayed as this woman has on display the 12 tribes that are important throughout biblical history, but they're also important here. In Revelation, because we've seen 12 tribes uh, are going to be represented, the 12 tribes are going to be represented by the 144,000 that are going to go out to uh, to evangelize, to uh, to witness to Israel. Uh, and the consequences of that witnessing, we've already seen some of it, we're going to see more of it here in chapter 12, as we have a remnant of Israel that is protected by God out in the wilderness. Um, go on, the woman is, as John looks, she's pregnant. Uh, she immediately, verse two, uh, you know, this is the, the quickest pregnancy and birth ever. Uh, she's with child. She cries out in labor pain. She gives birth. Kristen, is it that easy? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> You're the only woman in the room tonight. <laughs> uh, and, and we find it's not going to be easy because of what happens next. But this is symbolic of Christ. The woman is not Mary. Uh, you know, in the sense that uh, Catholicism or other uh, religions would would try to make something like this into uh, a focal point for Mary and, and an object of worship. Again, this is representative of all Israel. Uh, and um, it, it's neat because we, we understand that Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. And sometimes we get a little exclusive with that idea. And, and not wrongly, because that's where the Messiah was to come from, and uh, he's to come from the line of David and so forth. But we also have to remember that Jesus was also the, the product, if you will, of all of Israel. He came through that Abrahamic line and that, uh, that line of Jacob to be the son of Israel, and specifically the, the son of Judah, the son of David. Uh, but this gives us that. I mean, it, it demonstrates that Christ comes out of Israel, not just part of Israel. He comes out of Israel uh, in accordance with God's promises and in accordance with God's plan of redemption for not only Israel, but for uh, the world, whosoever will, that might come and put their faith in him. Uh, as soon as the child's born, and, well, let's back up just a second. This is a male child, clearly. Uh, spelled out for us as we go down into uh, uh, verse four and five. Um, this child is clearly Jesus Christ because of the phraseology in verse five, that he is going to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God uh, and his throne. I mean, you can't get any clearer than that without saying uh, this is Jesus Christ. This harkens back to uh, 
uh, to Psalm chapter 2 and Isaiah 9, 6. And uh, if we want to go to the New Testament, Luke 1, at the birth of Christ, 29 to 33, you have uh, these statements about the governmental um, authority that uh, the Messiah is going to have, not only towards the nation of Israel, but towards all nations. All right, comments or questions before we go and look at the persecution here? All right, the woman undergoes persecution from the dragon, verse uh, three. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon uh, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. He drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the angel stood before uh, the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And I know I've already read this, so I'm going to stop there because we don't need to re every, read everything over again. But this is the persecution, part of the persecution that the woman has undergone. And what it appears as we go through verses three through six is this is both a kind of a, a quick history lesson as well as a look at what's going to happen during the tribulation. And one through five or, and beyond, actually, one through four is kind of the history lesson because um Satan was what before he was represented as a boy. You didn't even let me get the question out. <laughs> Say it again. He was an angel of light. All right. He was, he was an angel. He was, uh, the, was the, cherub, the cherub, the covering cherub. Uh, and so an angel of high authority of great beauty of, uh, of light. Uh, you're right. Um, and so this is a, uh, quite a contrast. So this takes us all the way back to when, Satan fell whenever that might have been, and there's lots of different opinions on when that happened, uh, but he's represented here as this great fiery red dragon, and um, so we get, we go back into history, uh, and perhaps if you put Satan's fall before creation, then prehistory, but somewhere in the past, uh, we have Satan uh, who was there and then uh, certainly in, in, uh, in God's presence in uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 and, uh, and, and other passages we could go to to talk about Satan, Job 1 and 2, um, talk about uh, Satan's history, uh, but Satan was cursed when he deceived uh, mankind. Uh, and and w when and where the the transformation or the change in terminology that God uses for Satan as being a this covering cherub to being this uh, fiery red dragon uh, is unclear when it all occurs and takes place, but it has taken place here. That's where he, or I'm sorry, that's where he takes us back to. So here we have this fiery red dragon who represents Satan. Uh, his tail takes a third of the stars out of heaven. There's uh, contra uh, controversy. There's differing of opinions on when this was. Is this back when the uh, the angels fell with Satan in the rebellion? That would be my position on it, that this is also looking back to a, whatever time in the past that uh, a third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion. And that's what this is representing here. Uh, and then the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. And, you know, this is this is not, in my opinion, this is not isolated. This is not just when Christ is born. When were some other times that Satan uh, tried to, to destroy the nation of Israel in biblical history? In Egypt. Okay, in Egypt. I mean, in Egypt, you have a very similar situation uh, that you do when Christ is born. You have uh, the babies that are being, uh, the, the male babies that are being killed. Uh, you know, in, in, in terms of when Christ was born, there was this prophetic heads up to Herod that caused the order to go out and, and slaughter the innocents. But in Egypt, it's, it's a little more interesting to me because there's no prophetic heads up uh, to, to Pharaoh to do this. What was the reason that Pharaoh... Uh, contrived to destroy uh, the male babies in, in Egypt. He failed at 
Israelites were getting too strong. They okay. Overflow the throne, come a threat. Okay, good. Yeah, the the nation of Israel within Egypt was was too numerous in their opinion. They didn't want them to get so populous that they might become a threat to the throne. So they killed the the males that would one day grow up to be strong males and perhaps take up arms against Egypt. It was a practical reason, but was it only a practical reason? Of course yeah. not. It's always Satan. And why why is Satan set on all the way back then? Why is Satan set on trying to destroy the nation of Israel? Why is he crouching to to destroy the child as the child in my air quotes uh, that's going to culminate in in Jesus Christ? But why is he there? And we can go to other examples in the Assyrian captivities, the Babylonian captivities, using the Philistines, using the Edomites using all these other nations to try to wipe out Israel. Why does he have a vested interest in that? Okay, now, did you all hear that? It really goes all the way back to Genesis, and it's remarkable how much in biblical theology and both Old Testament and New Testament traces back to Genesis, and particularly how much traces back to the first few chapters of Genesis. And the reason that Satan has a vested interest is, uh, for, for one reason, is because God had said that the seed of the woman was going to crush his head. And so to ensure his own survival, he's, he's, he's uh, interested in destroying uh, the seed of the woman. As it becomes more specific in God's plan, God said, not only is the seed of the woman going to destroy your head, uh, crush your head, it's going to be through this specific seed. It's going to be through Abram's seed and later through Isaac's seed and then through Jacob's seed. That succession narrows it down to a specific line of people. And so since that time, you know, Satan, Satan uh, is well defined by Christ uh, as the thief who does what? Steal, kill, and destroy. Uh, that's his occupation, to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, he does it with, not just with Israel. He, he you know, he's, he's having a heyday in our culture right now, and he has in cultures in the past. Uh, he had, had a, a, a populace that is willing to join him. Uh, and follow him in in theft, destruction, and uh, steal, kill, and, and murder. <laughs> um, he and he revels in it, but he especially focuses his attention on uh, the nation of Israel and on anyone who would be vested in uh, following God, uh, who would be the people of God, and who would be. Uh, vested in in living righteous lives so uh, it's it, it gets a little more even more so intense with israel be, why why is he still so caught up on israel the messiah has been born uh who's going to crush his head the cross is done the resurrection's done so why why keep trying with israel what what's his intent do you think Well, Israel to doubt. Okay. To, uh, to, to cause Israel to doubt God's word. Uh, if that's his intent, job well done. Because they, 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 have, they do not, I, it, I've shared it before when we were over there, it's, it's almost depressing how little you hear about God. I mean, you see a lot of Bible-related things and locations, but to hear the Jews talk about their faith in God, uh, it's, you don't hear it a lot um, or see it a lot. Uh, you see a lot of, of you know, practice, uh, observing the Sabbath and observing the feast and things like that. But that that's part of it. What else? Maybe if God is going to ask them, praise be God. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I say a lot of countries. There's only medicine in there. Yeah, it's, it's uh, about the glory of Israel. Yeah, it's it's a sad dynamic for sure. What do you think? What are the gentle tone? His imminent destruction. Okay. Prophetic. Obviously, aspects of uh, the remnant of God's people still glorifying him and ushering in the destruction of, of the power of the dark. Okay. 
that that's perfectly possible as well. And I'm going to come down to I I don't know, you know, I can't say absolute. This is one of those things I can't say absolute. But there's several things that are a possibility, and one of them is to postpone his own destruction. And that you know that depends on how much we think or believe that Satan really believes that God's going to be successful in destroying him. Okay. And that's, that would be another one is to try to, try to thwart the plan of God, try to overthrow the plan of God, which is related to what Stefan said, to try to thwart, to overthrow God in order to uh, postpone or eliminate his, his own demise. God would be basically God would not be God. Okay. Right. Yeah. And, and regardless of, of the, the, the things that we can come up with is what his motives might be. None of them really matter because God's God's program is not going to be overthrown and Satan's demise is already sure. And, uh, you know, I heard someone talk once about if, if, if Satan could, which he can't, but if in Satan's mind, he thinks he can, uh, de delay or thwart or overthrow uh, or interrupt the plan and purpose of God, then he, in his in his way, kind of perverted thing, can make God a liar. Well, it's it's all conjecture, uh, and if that's what he's in, if that's what he's engaged in, or if that's what we engage in as people, uh, it's it's going to come to to it won't come to any fruition because God is not a liar. God can't be made a liar. It's not in his uh, his character, his attributes to lie. So uh, he's going to keep his promises. Satan realizes God has a lot of promises left to keep to Israel. Um, uh, and Satan has a lot of promises left to, to keep concerning what's going to happen with Satan himself and those that followed him in the rebellion. Uh, a lot of people kind of get in the mind that God's going to destroy Israel. That's not true at all. Right. If he, if he had an evil, it would be what? Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or yeah. And he has no equal, but yeah, you're right. I, Satan is not God's counter, counterpart in the sense that they are they are similar in power or equal in power. They're not a, a yin and yang kind of thing. And I know that's a, somebody told me not too long ago, uh, what well, was Donna Lee in one of our Sunday school classes? She said, "Oh no, it was in uh, in the home in the uh, marriage testimony class." She said, "You know, really keep an eye out for this yin and yang. It's making a comeback, and people are really latching onto it." And I said, oh. "I thought to myself, I've not seen that." And ever since she said that, it's everywhere. <laughs> what is going on? Uh, well, we shouldn't be surprised because Satan delights in anything that draws people's attention away from. Uh, from what God has to say in his word, and certainly whatever uh, draws people's attention away from Jesus Christ. And so Satan is master at that. He's a master deceiver. Again, uh, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And uh, much of the destruction he brings comes through through that deception. Uh, but Satan and, and I chase a little rabbit, Satan and God are not, you know, equal counterparts or counterpoints. Uh, Satan is not omniscient. He can't be everywhere at once. He can't know everything at once. He's a being of great uh, intelligence, but he is still a created being. And uh, we have to be mindful of that. Otherwise, we we make God and Satan into these like Marvel or DC comic book characters that are equally matched. And one day one of them wins and one day the other one wins and curses, you know, well, that's too old for you guys. That's how they used to do it in the comic books when, when I was a kid, curses. Um, and it's not the case. This, that's one of the values of the book of Revelation and of Daniel and the Olivet Discourse is that God's already laid out how this is going to culminate. I mean, it's already been written. Uh, and it's written not by just some conjecture or uh, some human author. This is this is God given. This is God breathed. Uh, and not only that, and this is one of the things I love about Revelation. It's not only God breathed, 
but God brings John up to heaven to show him these things. So John is not just writing it down by the direction of the Holy Spirit, which is enough, not just because it is breathed out by God so that he hear it, hears it, which is enough, but he gets to be an eyewitness. And who better? You know, the, the same apostle that writes in 1 John, what our hands have handled, what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard concerning the word of life, who was that eyewitness to Jesus Christ. Now he's an eye witness an ear witness a tactile witness to the things that are going to happen at the end of days and it's uh, it kind of gives me goosebumps but um, i think it's it's neat which is really sad and ignorant the book of revelation is the most dense integration of the old testament scripture it, of the Indian testament. it really is yeah and it, would, it would be beyond the bounds of any kind of intimation by human form or you know the aid of psychotropics or whatever people think it's really sad but it's the power of darkness is going to be slavery but it's it is just really, it's, it's, it's a, a, another modern frustration that people they're like oh he must have just taken ayahuasca because people you know dmt whatever joe rogan talks about people just leave god and do this and like oh that must be what john did because it's something hard to believe. Yes. And so that they think that without knowing that the book of John or I mean Revelation is like theologically the densest really of the entire New Testament. It is. It you know it it it's it's when we see a book that is in a in a series of doctrines that is attacked so vehemently by Satan uh, and. I got to be careful here by theologians, which sometimes are in the same league, um, unfortunately, because they, they, you know, you've got theologians that have either never been converted in the first place or who have been led astray by bad doctrine. Uh, when you see any, any uh, doctrine that is, that is that attacked, it uh, is usually a good indicator that it's an important doctrine. And, that one of the great frustrations over my lifetime is to see uh, churches and teachers and preachers move away from eschatology. I think we can focus too much. I mean, some ministries, that's all they preach is last times, end times, end times. And sometimes congregations are too focused. That's all they want to hear. Well, I just want to hear about what's going to happen. Uh, it's like anything else in the Christian life. There's balance. We have to deal with the whole counsel of God, not just one uh, one part of it, but to exclude it or to write it off as allegory or, as Seven said, to make it, you know, John was on a trip, uh, you know, a psychedelic trip or a psychotrophic trip. You know, I've heard similar things about, I read something a few years ago about, uh, the, uh, about Elijah being... Uh, manic depressive you know so we take these terms that we've come up with and say well but after and they just didn't matter of fact well you know elijah was manic depressive uh and it what it does is uh and i think it was uh i think it was john MacArthur that that used a phrase that i love uh regardless of what you know you some of the the failings over there or the the things we might call into question uh, is that we can take uh, and trivialize the the profound. We can take some of the, the the great truths of God's word and make them trivial, and that's a biblical principle. The Jews uh, unfortunately did that; that they treated as common the things of God. And when we do that, we put ourselves at, at great risk uh, spiritually as believers. We put ourselves in uh, great risk to be disciplined by God, and we have to be super careful. All right. Well, we chase that rabbit down. Anyone, any other questions or comments? I guess I ask you a question. That's how that all started. I I let the rabbit loose. Satan, uh, if you don't remember, where we, I'm surprised I remember because I have a bad habit of losing track. I asked, why would Satan want to destroy Israel? Why is he so bent on it? And here we come all the way to the end of uh, both scripture and all the way to the end of the end events of the world going into the millennial kingdom. And then even after the millennial kingdom, Satan comes out of the pit. He's still bent on destroying Israel and on uh, going against Christ. Uh, why is that? Well, because he's opposed to God. Fundamentally, that's what it is. And he's opposed to anything 
that is related to uh, God's plan and program, God's great and precious promises, God's plan for Satan, uh, even as he begins to see it realized when he spends that part of that thousand years in a pit, and he comes out ready to go to war again, not ready to repent, not ready to turn, not ready to uh, own up to uh, his error and his sin, but to go right back to war with God. And my goodness. Uh, he, still, he still believes he can overthrow God's plan. So he never doesn't it, get it, 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 That's what it appears. That's for sure. All right. Any other questions or comments? So um, as as we go down through this, we're going to look next time because we're going to run out of time. But I'm going to see how these, this remind myself how this is laid out. Okay. Yeah. We're going to talk about that at the end. So we kind of have an overview in the notes of what's going to happen in this chapter. But one of the things that's going to happen just before letter B there in, on page two, uh, the woman is going to undergo persecution uh, from the dragon, which intensifies during the last 1260 days. So, you know, this is one of those places in um, Revelation that gives us a kind of a flag as to when events are going to occur. So if verses three and four are looking back at the past, verse uh, five, looking back uh, to some degree at the past, she bore the male child, but looking forward to the future uh, in that he's going to uh, rule with a rod of iron. Uh, looking back at the fact that, that Christ was caught up uh, in the, res in the uh, resurrection and ascension to God and his throne. Verse six deals with John's present, where he's at in this, in this uh, vision in heaven as he's uh, witnessing the things of the tribulation. Verse six is going to happen in the midst of the tribulation. She, she Israel, is going to flee, in, flee into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So uh, this seems to indicate that, that uh, as we looked at in chapter 11 last time, that um, those that respond to the, wit the two witnesses teaching their death, their resurrection, their ascension into heaven, you have all these people that believe it appears in Israel, in Jerusalem uh, would be Jewish, that that's perhaps the remnant that God has always promised that's going to go into the millennial kingdom. So in order to preserve that remnant uh, for the, the rest of the tribulation, which this, again, gives us a gives us a flag, this happens at the midpoint of the tribulation, God takes this remnant out into the wilderness uh, in the in. Israel or in the region, uh, the Middle East region, and and protects them out there supernaturally for uh, three and a half years. And, you know, this is another one of those points, as Stephen pointed out a little bit ago, that lay people, scholars, people that read scripture look at it and say, well, this can't happen. Uh, there's no way this can happen. And in order to conclude that, in particular, something I would, I would say this simple in comparison to some of the other things we see in Revelation can't happen, then you have to discount most of the Old Testament. You have to discount the, uh, the deliverance from Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea, which, by the way, a lot of people discount and say that again. Now you have to discount a man was swallowed by great fish and vomited up on the land three days later, uh, which a lot of people do discount. I don't discount those things because they're breathed out by God. They're attached to his attribute of truthfulness. They are, they are attached to God's good name. And this again, same thing. It, it's not beyond God's uh, capabilities, God's uh, sovereignty to take whatever number this is. And we don't have a number. We know it's a, a sizable number as we look, if, if this in fact is the remnant that God's talked about. Uh, we go back and look in the Old Testament about the remnant that he's going to preserve. He never attaches, to, to my knowledge, any uh, specific numbers, but it appears to be a, a good number, uh, enough to go in and, and populate the kingdom in, during that thousand years. And so he is going to preserve this remnant of Israel uh, much as he's as he's characterized it throughout the Old Testament prophets with Ezekiel and with Isaiah 
and Jeremiah and the, the minor prophets as well, that he's going to do it miraculously. Uh, and Ezekiel uses the uh, the imagery of the dry bones. And, uh, you, you know, this, this is God. This is something God's going to do. And so, you know, in, in uh, post-World War II, everyone was excited to see Israel go back to the land. And that must be the fulfillment of God's promise. And it's not. I mean, not in the way that God's going to do it. It might be part of it. But when God, you know, preserves a remnant of Israel for the kingdom, it's going to look like this. It's going to look impossible. And I know there were impossibilities, you know, quote, impossibilities surrounding post-World War II, uh, Israel and its reformation and, and, all, and the things even that we see today. There are, you know, how is this happening? Uh, but it's not the full fulfillment of what God is going to do. When that happens, it's going to happen in the context of the tribulation. Uh, it's going to happen in the context of these mir miraculous things. It's going to happen in the context of judgment, uh, the context of great uh, revival in Israel of Jews. We do not see that yet. Uh, it's going to be unmistakable is my point. And so um, he's, going to, he's going to keep her out there for three and a half years to sustain her. While the rest of the world, in a sense, is uh, is going to hell. I mean, you've got the bold judgments that are about to happen. And by the way, this is what where people kind of flag the uh, the dividing up of the judgments is if the last trumpet in the trumpet judgments sound here, the next chronological thing we have is right here which goes on through the uh, the rest of the tribulation, the last three and a half years. And so the uh, bowl judgments, I say bowl, I meant trumpet. The bowl judgments coming would be in the last three and a half years, but it's it's hard to pinpoint when, uh, when the three sets of judgments are going to occur exactly, but uh, they do get increasingly more severe and the most severe obviously is gonna be at the end. All right, comments or questions? how much we have here do you want to talk about the devil some more we can talk about the devil <laughs> all right let's talk about uh oh man yeah we can talk about it verse seven war broke out in heaven michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer so the great angel was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Let's just take those few verses and then we'll call it a, call it a night. John sees a second sign in heaven. Uh, he sees the uh, dragon uh, and his angels. And that's uh, significant because you don't have um, that terminology uh, elsewhere, where it's Satan and his angel, the dragon and his angels, but those are fallen angels. They were all once angelic beings, Michael and his angels, Satan and his angels. They're all created. They were all angelic, holy angels at one time, righteous angels. But uh, th what we saw back at the, at the top of the, the page or the top of the chapter occurred at some time in the past and now you have fallen angels as well as righteous angels they seem to be fixed if you get into the doctrine of angelology there doesn't appear to be traffic back and forth where some you know an angel decide a demon decides i'm gonna i want to get saved or i want to come over back over to god's side it seems to be fixed for uh whatever reason reasons we're not going to see until we we go to be with the lord and even then, uh, it's at God's discretion whether he reveals to it, it to us. And we also don't see what I've seen popular in uh, or read about that's popular sometimes in uh, uh, in some entertainment or in comic books that you have a, a holy angel that decides, hey, I should have went with Satan in the first place. And they decide to defect over. It seems to be a, a fixed thing. When it happened, uh, there was no going back either way. Uh, but the... Uh, dragon here is is not necessarily that Satan is a dragon, but he's symbolized as a dragon or a serpent is what it literally means, a great serpent. It's used 13 times uh, in uh, scripture, 
and only in the book of Revelation, but it is representative of Satan uh, or Lucifer or the devil, his, his many names. Well, what do the descriptions mean? The red, it might indicate massive amount of bloodshed and violence. Satan is responsible for red is associated with, uh, with war, uh, not only in, in the Bible, but uh, outside of scripture. Uh, you have red sometimes associated with war or with violence. Uh, that he is great perhaps indicates Satan's influence over the world. Certainly he is great, not in the way that, you know, not good, but he's powerful and he has a great deal of influence and a great deal of sway and has all the way back to the beginning uh, of the world. And uh, number three, he has seven heads, 10 horns, seven diadems or crowns is all symbolic of uh, the nations uh, and the empires that he's had sway over. This is not a comprehensive list. This is a list that is attached to every kingdom or great kingdom that has existed uh, going back into uh, the history of mankind, certainly uh, post-flood history. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then what's sometimes called the revived Roman Empire because it is clearly attached to Rome here in Revelation as well as in the book of Daniel. Uh, so Satan, you know, having Satan associated with those seven heads or those seven kingdoms uh, makes clear what we see in Daniel and we see here that he has had a great deal of influence. We could even say a great deal of control in those kingdoms and those that last kingdom extends today. Uh, that that idea of the revived Roman Empire or that, uh, that, that eventual one world government, as we call it sometimes, uh, has its tendrils into, uh, into increasingly more nations uh, in our time today. And the 10 horns likely all on that seventh head represent uh, the confederation of uh, nations or rulers during the tribulation. And we talked about that last year in Daniel uh, 7. And uh, looking uh, closely at Daniel last year and a little bit as we looked at the Olivet Discourse, his tail again drew those one third of stars out of heaven uh, is likely a, a reference to Satan's fall as we talked about earlier. And again, his primary goals are to frustrate God's plans and purposes regarding Christ and Israel uh, and the dragon's attempt to devour the child is a reference to Satan's many attempts to uh, kill Christ uh, out of God's intended time and purposes. And so not only at the time of Christ, but to eliminate the possibility that Christ could ever be born by persecuting the nation of Israel uh, throughout. Uh, you can also make a, a pretty compelling case that uh, Satan's activities against Israel since the time of Christ are for the purposes of snuffing out promised individuals like the 144,000 and the two witnesses, if they're to be born on the earth, which I believe they are. Uh, it's, it's another set of promised prophets and uh, witnesses that if Satan can eliminate Israel, he eliminates them as well. All right, we've got a few minutes. Anybody have any final comments or questions tonight? Is that one that matters? I believe that's when Satan's going to cast out of his fight spine, take his spine on the soil over the earth. Well, yeah, let's go back and talk about it because it's really not in the notes. Uh, well, we're going to talk about it next week, so we'll wait for that. Um, yeah, well, Christ will take his his place on the throne on earth when he establishes the kingdom on earth. Is that what you mean? Oh, he cast Satan like uh, Satan sits on the throne with God over the earth. No, no, no. That's a father. I understand. That's the decision he got from Adam. Well, and then, I I understand what you're saying, but he doesn't. He hasn't taken a spot on the throne yeah. yet. But Satan doesn't. Yeah. Satan doesn't occupy a throne next to God or in heaven at all. There's nothing in scripture that indicates that. I know what you're saying. You're, you're talking about the fact that uh, Paul talks about for as an Adam all die, even though in Christ all should be made alive. You have that uh, as a word, Adam and Eve given over or, or fallen under the, the domain of Satan. He's called the prince of the power of the air, the prince of this world. He has that position, that power, but it's not a 
on par with God or sitting on a throne next to God position. You want you're not going to find that anywhere in scripture. I always understood it because I yeah, that's all right. That so I my understanding always was that Adam did Adam shared the throne of God, making his his he was the God Adam was God of this world. So but Satan wanted that so he used the woman to deceive him and get that throne. But he did Adam went along with the bell and he gave it all his seven powers to Satan under Yeah, well there I, I think you probably been I give it back for the man without sin must die. Yeah. I'll give I, it to that man. I think you've probably been exposed to a little bit of symbolism that made it a little murky. I mean, there's never any indication Adam was on a throne with God or next to God. Adam was given dominion over the earth, which That's is a ver very different, very different dynamic. So I think it's just a little confusion on that. But but I'm glad glad you brought it up because uh, I just encourage you to get go look at you know go look at the scripture associated with it and. Uh, it's because uh, those things are, are are not anywhere in scripture. I mean, you're you're right about Satan uh, or Adam kind of forfeiting the things that God had entrusted with him with and position the the fall uh, the fall and then the curse after that affected his position, affected his fellowship with God. It affected how he was going to be able to have dominion over the earth instead of. Uh, the pleasant garden instead it was thorns and thistles and things like that but uh, and to work with, from the sweat of his brow and things like that but uh, yeah but the but occupying a throne you're not not going to find that and satan having a throne with god that where we see satan in in heaven uh clearest is is here when he draws out the uh the other angels that follow him in rebellion and then in Job, where where he has to present himself before God on a regular basis and uh, basically give an account for what he's doing. And what is he doing? Well, he's roaming about, he's going around, looking around the world, roaming about the world to and fro. Uh, but he's he's not present he's not presented as occupying a throne anywhere except if we can attach him to these nations. He doesn't have a throne in hell, as we often put him, you know, in some great. A great throne room in hell with, a, with the burning flames and the, the skulls on top of the throne. That's just not biblical. Uh, but he, he is the prince of this world. And in that, he takes these thrones uh, that we just talked about. And I, again, I'd say many others that he is an influence. Uh, you know, is America mentioned here? Well, specifically, no. But is it mentioned here? Sure. Uh, does Satan have influence in America today, do you think? Sure. Uh, he, he seeks to influence any nation uh, to influence. Mm -hmm. He has a great deal of sway in uh, the political realm. And I don't mean just Republican, Democrat politics. I mean, worldwide politics. I mean, <laughs> it. The funny thing is, as Christians, and it's and I shouldn't say it's a funny thing, it's kind of a sad thing, is that we look at politics and we don't recognize the demonic element in it, and it ought to be self-evident to us. I mean, we make jokes about, oh yeah, a politician, when, does, when do politicians lie? Every time they open their mouth. Har, 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 har. And that's the character of Satan. You know, he is a liar. Christ says definitively, he's a liar from the very beginning. It's, it's his very nature. And so the thrones that Satan gets to occupy are many more than than God would offer him, which he wouldn't offer him. But I mean, he's occupied the throne of Babylon and the throne of Persia and the throne of Egypt and on down through certainly Rome and and will occupy this throne in a very in the in the uh, tribulation in a very real way and perhaps the most powerful way that he's ever occupied a throne through a, an individual. Uh, throughout human history, so good. It's really interesting, uh, speaking of that, and the nations, and, and you know, talking about what Satan's motivation against Israel, which is a loaded question and it's not sure. a thing to play on one, but uh, not a judge question. But um, one of the things there that Moses actually sheds a lot of light on that is in Deuteronomy 32, where he's given his song in 89, he says, When the most high divided of the nations, you know, gave them their inheritance according to the sons of God. Of God, like the nation, 
Israel, you know, Jacob was his allotment of his yes. portion, so the nation, the people of Israel, but also the land, which is why the rest of the nations, uh, you know, when he divided them up, aka a lot of you could probably be understood as like the Tower of Babel, where yes, that the, the, the fallen angels, the powers of darkness, the, the power, the authority, and all those things are, are these rebellious yes. things that are opposed to, to God and the nation of Israel in general. And so Moses like recaps that the events of Genesis in the in Moses' song in Hebrew 32, which discusses and kind of frame the, the rest of history after that for the nation of Israel all the way to Revelation. It does. Wild it does. It's it's fascinating and it's uh a little yeah. All right, well I hear kids. So uh they're getting out early tonight. So let's pray together. Thank you all for your input and uh, uh Read ahead, and we'll come back and talk some more next week. Heavenly Father, we come thanking you for this time uh, to, again, get a view on things yet future. We pray that you would just give us uh, wisdom and understanding in these things to, uh, most of all, understand that they will happen, and because they will happen, that we need to be diligent as believers to uh, be a, a, a testimony, a Christ-like testimony in our day-to-day -day lives, and to be ready to give an account for the hope that's within us. Father, we pray that you'll go with each one. As they leave this place, that their uh, hearts would be turned to you and that we would uh, we would glorify you with our lives. We thank you again for uh, your great grace and your great love in our lives in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you all. Um, next week is Superhero Night, so you're welcome to join us at Kids for Truth. We'll be having dinner, uh, so you can check out the flyers and the bulletin board if you want to come and join us for that at 6 o'clock.